Good everyone and welcome to today's Living Life. Welcome to a new month, the month of October, and we begin a new book, the book of Job. And it's exciting and scary at the same time. In a sense, I'm glad I get to do the first four days uh, because I think it's only going to get harder and harder from here. I think everyone kind of has this expectation and understanding of the book of Job. And I got to be honest, um, I have yet to actually study through the book of Job. So this is my first time. So I was excited, also scared, nervous, uh, and I've already learned so much. I mean, obviously, this isn't a Bible study. This isn't a sermon. Um, but I've had to prepare somewhat, at least a little bit. And the little bit that I did, I've already learned so much. And there's a lot more that I would like to get into. So over the next couple of days um, and weeks, maybe even months, as we go through the book of Job, I would like you to kind of put your thinking cap on and approach this in a fresh way. Maybe even kind of just put a pin on the things that you know about the book of Job and Job and some of the issues. Because the fundamental issue in the book of Job may not be what you thought, what you think, because it's certainly not what I thought. It's about how, it's not just about how we act that is important, but why we act in the way that we do. And everything has to be in relation to God. And with that is our view of God. So our heart motives can only be sorted out in relation to our concept and understanding of God and what we believe drives Him and His will on this earth and in our lives. Yeah. So let's read the passage and then we'll continue. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Now, as we begin, we want to begin by setting the stage and the person of who Job is. Now, compared to pretty much every other book of the Bible, very little is known about the author and this main person that we see um, in this book, who is Job. Now, we do know what kind of person he is just in this first chapter, and that's pretty much all we know. We know that Job is not an Israelite, and um, most people kind of pick him to be around the same time as Abraham. I have a personal theory, not based on anything really scientific or textual, anything. I just had a, I kind of had a thought while I was reading through one time that I think personally, and please don't quote me anywhere else, uh, that Job predates Abraham by maybe even a big chunk of time, I think, right? So we don't really know. And he's definitely a foreigner and he is a man of great wealth. And then in verse one, the NLT describes him as blameless, a man of complete integrity, and he feared God and stayed away from evil. So we want, to look, we want to look at what kind of person Job is. And I think within that, we can also learn about ourselves and our relation with God, in, uh, ourselves in relation to God. Now, in being blameless, this is referring to his character, to a person's character. The opposite of being blameless in the Bible, if we look elsewhere, is that we can be proclaimed guilty and also wicked. And it, has, it is closely tied with integrity. And so a person who is blameless cannot be blamed and they have no guilt, right? So no guilt stay, sticks on them. They are blameless. The next word description, uh, the NIV says upright, uh, whereas in the NLT it says complete in integrity. 
And this refers to a person's actions, so Job's actions. And this term is commonly used to describe people who behave according to God's expectations. One example is King Joash in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. So there is the standard, and here it is God's standard, and Joash met that standard, and so he found favor in, with God. An upright person gains God's favor according to God's uprightness. That's, you know, his standard, right? But this uprightness can also be taken or approached subjectively. For example, in the book of Judges that we just ended for the last, what is it, two months or so, there was that one verse that was repeated a few times. The Israelites did what was right in their own eyes. Now, that word right, you can also say did what was upright in their own eyes, right? What was correct according to their own eyes because they had no king and they were departing from the faithfulness and the commands of God. Now, I don't necessarily see it as the reason being that there was, there was no king, but really it's that they refused to recognize the king that they already had and that they've always had, which is their God. The God who rescued them from Egypt, the God who, you know, the pillar of fire and the cloud, like that God who parted the Red Sea they stopped recognizing him as their king. That's when the problems started. Now, but these terms do not describe people who live, you know, sinless lives, you know, being perfect and completely holy and so forth. But they describe people who found favor in the eyes of God and other people, like I said, according to that standard, right? So if there is a standard, then it also kind of means that it can be subjective depending on whose eyes that you look at it from. So the point in the introduction here in today's passage is that Job was upright and complete in integrity in God's eyes, right? Not just Job's eyes in his subjective you know, perspective or his friends or his family, his co-workers or you know, slaves and whatnot. In God's eyes, Job was upright and completely complete in integrity because he feared God. And um, a common way this is expressed in the Old Testament is to take God seriously. And it can mean different things, again, kind of a little bit of subjectivity on how you understand God, how you know God. And for non-Israelites, fear God mean, meant being ritually or ethically conscientious, as in, you know, they are aware of what God requires in terms of the rituals and how you should live your life and what you should do and not do. And we see a little bit of that in today's passage, how Job tries to keep his children ritualistically pure, right? He offers sacrifices, you know, nothing, not for what he did or, you know, didn't do, but something that his children might have done, not necessarily absolutely did in case they sin against God and they curse God or say something against him. Now, this idea of curse, we'll talk about it in a few, more in a few days, but what could this mean? How do you curse God? We have some examples in the Old Testament, and just to give you a brief outline, they are basically of offensive words spoken against God in their hearts and taking, God, uh, taking credit for what God did, misjudging God's motives, thinking that God will not act, expressing your own ambitions against God, expressing your own arrogance against God, and stating that there is no God. Right? These are some of the ways that you could curse in um, God, practical expressions. So there is a foreshadowing and a preview of what Job will be driven to do later, and that is he actually does begin to, in a sense, curse God, blaming him and asking God to come down and defend yourself against me and my situation. So why does the author choose this sort of example in today's passage to describe and illustrate Job's piety and spirituality. And the question for us is, how would you illustrate or describe your spirituality and relationship with God? That's something for us to think about. So I mentioned in the, in the introduction that it's not just, just about what we do, but why we do what we do that is important in relation to God. 
sometimes we think if we do, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then we are holy. We can check those boxes off, you know, so forth. And some of those things can represent things like tithing, giving, going to church, attending small group, serving in a ministry, going on mission trips, and, you know, right, read your Bibles and do your quiet time and so forth. Sometimes we put too much emphasis on the things that we do. But the book of Job and this chapter is going to slowly open your eyes, I hope and pray, to the motive. The why we do what we do is more important than what you do. And that it all begins with our view and understanding of God. So the question today for us to think about is, let us reflect on our spirituality and our view of God, which cannot be separated as we begin to think about our motives, our true heart motives in what we do, even for God. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And as we begin this book of uh, Job, that's commonly kind of taken as difficult, hard to understand, and even controversial in a lot of different areas, I pray that you would grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord, and most importantly, hearts to understand and to receive directly from you, O God. May you give clarity to myself and all the other pastors who will be speaking from this book and everyone who will be doing their quiet times, uh, Lord, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people all over the world with living life. Help us to see and understand and open our hearts, Lord, um, and may your anointing be with us as we grow in you. Help us to see our heart motives in light of you, your heart, your grace, and your love for us, Lord. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.